With that, I want to introduce tonight's speaker, Jim Polzinski. Jim has worked as a consultant, consulting knowledge engineer for various steel companies, including Bethlehem Steel, Luke and Steel, DeFosco Steel, and Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel. He developed an interest in the iron and steel industry in Lebanon Cornwall while renovating and restoring the Cornwall Company store. He is currently president of the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace. Please welcome our speaker, Jim Polzinski. Oh, thanks, Mike. That was very nice. And thanks for everybody who uh, is taking some time out from your uh, watching uh, the news tonight, right? Uh, to have a little history. Uh, I especially like talking about American iron and steel because I think it's one of the forgotten iron uh, industries in the Lebanon area. We all know, and rightly so, about the furnace, the Cornwall Iron Furnace, and we know about Robert H. Coleman, and we might know about the uh, Lebanon furnaces that uh, the Coleman's from Coleman Park ran, but sometimes the American iron and steel gets forgotten. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about that about the formation of uh, American Iron Steel, how it came to be, and then also uh, in the strike of 1902 that was actually occurred in downtown Lebanon. There's, it was actually quite a tense time for the community for a number of months, and, and uh, hopefully maybe there'll be something here that you haven't heard before. <clears throat> I'm just going to give this summary page. This might be a lot of uh, a lot of text, I've got a lot of images following this, but I, I just wanted to, this is the announcement from August 21st, 1899 at the formation of the company. And I, I wanna point out especially that it was capitalized at $20 million. Now, 3 million of that was preferred stock, 17 million common, but previous to that, uh, and actually um, the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Bolton Nut, which is one of the four companies that made up American Iron Steel when it was originally capitalized was capitalized at 150,000. This is $20 million. Uh, as you got into the late 1800s and the early 1900s, the rise of big business, I'll put quotes around big business, started to occur. And you will see across industries, you'll see large capitalizations, whereas maybe uh, before the Civil War, shortly after the Civil War, a company could actually you know, uh, come into existence with a little bit of money, a significant amount, but you oftentimes have relatives, uh, in-laws that were involved in the creation and the management of the company. This is the beginning of a very large corporation headquartered in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And you can notice that by the number of employees. Now that 4,000 employees, basically uh, uh, close to half of that was actually located in Reading and, and the other a little bit over half was located in Lebanon. Now they had uh, 31 puddling furnaces, and usually when we think of furnaces, we think of something like the iron furnace or what might have been uh, at the Lebanon furnaces, but the puddling furnaces were a little different. They were used for different purposes than a, a full blast furnace, and in the uh, puddling furnaces would separate the heat source from the iron. And they also did have 20 heat furnaces, and they did have uh, modern technology that had come about in the late 1800s, at least introduced in the, in the States here, open hearth and Bessemer. So they had a, a number of means to be able to uh, take the iron and heat it up and, and uh, manufacture the various products that we'll look at later, the numerous number of products they had. They had offices in Lebanon and um, the headquarters was an office. They had plants in Reading and, and uh, and uh, in Lebanon. Now, if you'll notice, the, the, some of the names on this list might be familiar to you and some might not be. Uh, Arthur Brock was the first chairman of the executive committee. Uh, Arthur Brock was, uh, you know, married one of the Coleman daughters. J.H. Sternberg, you might not know in Lebanon, but if you go to Reading uh, and uh, Kai Scove restored his mansion, Sterling Mansion, which I believe now is under another name, Arthur Brock's uh, brother, Horace Brock. W.W. Gibbs, who was actually a, uh, a financier, a, a deal maker. He basically brokered this deal. Uh, you might not recognize the name, but he was uh, worked with uh, uh, Widener down in Philadelphia in forming the uh, uh, United uh, uh, Gas Improvement Company, UGI. Uh, also, the forerunner of Exide was uh, a 
concern that was uh, put together by W. W. Gibbs. Kind of think of him as a minor J.P. Morgan. Never quite made the J.P. Morgan stage, and actually, kind of tragically, Gibbs uh, ended up losing his fortune and uh, kind of was broke at the end of his life. James Lord, that's uh, somebody who is is uh, very important to the whole story of American Steel. Uh, Herbert Sternberg is uh, uh, James Hervey Sternberg's uh, son, and H.J. Hayden came from uh, one of the Reading companies. H.M.M. Richards is somebody that we'll be talking a lot about later. And H.H. Light, that's probably a name that uh, many people from Lebanon recognize. So those were the people that came together to, to form this uh, uh, com new company, American Iron and Steel. So the, there were five uh, separate plants that were brought together. J.H. Sternberg and Son from Reading, National Bolt, Nut, and Rivet Works in Reading. And the reason why the uh, Lebanon East Iron Company is blocked together with the National Bolt, Nut, and Rivet Works is because prior to the actual creation of American Iron and Steel, National Bolt, Nut, and Rivet was looking to, uh, they needed a rolling mill essentially, and uh, rather than build a new rolling mill, they merged with the uh, Lebanon East Iron Company to create a new company, and that was just months before the creation of American Iron and Steel. Lebanon Iron Company and Pennsylvania Bolt and Nut, that's probably the, one of the more well-known uh, companies that, brought, uh, that were brought together in this merger. So we'll kind of look at each one of these individually. Uh, first of all, Sternberg. Now that, most of the pictures I have, uh, they're not uh, as young men, they're, they're older in, in their age. So Sternberg uh, actually um, started off, moved to Reading in, in 1865. He was uh, from upstate New York uh, in the Saratoga area, and he got employed with one of the railroads uh, up in uh, upstate New York, but eventually got swallowed up into the uh, uh, New York Central. Um, but he developed a problem with his eyesight very early on, and he couldn't do the kind of work that you would need to do as a bookkeeper or a clerk, which was the path that he was pursuing. So he found himself in a dilemma. If he's not going to be able to, uh, you know, do the clerk kind of work or, or that sort of thing, what could he do? And so he gave it some thought, and he decided he would go into manufacturing. And he moved to Reading. Uh, area in, in uh, 1865, and by 1869, I need to go back, <coughs> he created, this is, this is the first uh, uh, diagrams of the company that he formed, and it, uh, he formed the company in 1865, but the, the plant didn't get built until 1867 to 1869. Uh, there were very, most of the bolts and nuts at this point in, the, in, in time were basically still more or less handmade. There was not really an automated way to make bolt after bolt, nut after bolt, nut after nut. Uh, so there was a, a company from, uh, I believe, Connecticut uh, that was selling machines to make uh, pressed bolts. And Sternberg bought a couple of those, basically took his life savings, bought a couple of those machines, brought them down to Reading, and he wasn't 100% happy with how they worked, so he actually started to make modifications to the machines he bought, and one of the things that Sternberg brought to the new company, American Iron Steel, he had a number of patents. He patented, patented processes, and he patented machines. He was just really kind of a mechanical wizard, and he was very hands-on with his company. He was not an absentee owner. Uh, but he built up a very formidable, successful company. The uh, next one we're going to talk about is, uh, that was organized in 1890. The picture there is uh, a later picture of, of the plant. Uh, it was organized in 1890 by uh, Charles Wilhelm. His father was Aaron Wilhelm. And uh, Walter S. Davis was his uncle. H.J. Hayden was one of the people that uh, was on the, the first slide I showed you of the various names. So, uh, and Hallman was another name that was involved in American Iron Steel. So that whole management group 
came into American Iron and Steel. The interesting thing, and, and our, our uh, talk tonight actually ends in 1902, but uh, Shortly after 1902, I mean, actually, um, sorry, shortly before 1902, National Bolt, Nut, and Rivet was actually one of the weaker components of the companies they brought in, and they were more or less redundant. That's one of the reasons why uh, they merged with uh, the Lebanese Iron Company, is because they were basically doing the same kind of processing as Pennsylvania Bolt, Nut, and Sternberg and Son. So it was redundant. So rather than carry that uh, that plant as a fixed asset, they they uh, sold it. Now the interesting thing here is is that they sold it to Charles Wilhelm, who then turned it around and converted it to a paint factory. And the uh, his father Aaron Wilhelm and himself were very successful in the paint business. Um, and so they purchased this plant. From the company that they were officers in, and re and converted it to a uh, paint company. Uh, that's uh, the National Bolt Nut and Rivet Works, and the Lebanon East Iron Company. They were basically a rolling mill. I'm sure you know the name H. H. Light, very famous uh, Lebanon uh, person, very important in the history of Lebanon, and uh, he uh, was the the. I'm sorry, the plant was over in more in the Avon area of Lebanon, East Lebanon. Now, the next uh, company that um, made up the five was founded in 1865 as the Aurora Iron Company, and then they later renamed it the Lebanon Tube and Iron Works. And the thing about this company is they never quite were 100% successful. They, they, they never quite made the money that they were hoping they were going to make. Robert H. Coleman, uh, Purchased it in 1882, uh, basically bought the majority of the shares. Uh, they changed the name to the Lebanon Iron Company, and it was a, it was a good fit because you know right down right next to where the uh, Lebanon Iron Company was, you had the Colbert furnaces. They're putting out the pig iron. They could be using that in the uh, Lebanon Iron Company. So for for Coleman, as he was just developing the Colbert furnaces, it was a good fit for for what he had planned to do to basically have a rolling mill. And then actually, um, not too many years after he got involved with Lebanon Iron Company, they expanded uh, the capacity of, of that mill. So it was a good fit for him. Now, as we all know, later on in the 1890s, Robert H. Coleman lost uh, his fortune. So, you know, he exited the business. When he did so, Aaron Wilhelm became, uh, you know, more prominent in, the affairs of the Lebanon Iron Company. You'll notice the name there, Abraham Hess. That was uh, Robert uh, H. Coleman's private secretary and Thomas Evans, uh, general superintendent. He became very involved in American Iron and Steel. D.H.S. Hammond, uh, you might know that name as, as he was uh, in charge of the uh, Donamore furnace. So is the group of people that are represented by these five companies is really really a story of who's 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 who in the Lebanon industrial history around the late 1800s, early 1900s. And the final of uh, company that makes up the five of these is the Pennsylvania Bolton Nut. And this is James Lord as an older distinguished gentleman, uh, but as a young man, and actually in his teens, he fought uh, for the Union in the Civil War uh, from Maryland. Uh, from uh, one of the regiments in, in Maryland, and ended up uh, in Reading in 1871. He actually was Sternberg's head clerk. And I guess he had ambition and he saved a little bit of money. And in 1882, he went to Lebanon and basically put together a company very similar to the one he worked for, the, the Sternberg and Son. He uh, uh, and as I said earlier, it capitalized at 150,000. Uh, uh, There's a missing zero there. Sorry about that. But um, he only could come up with 25% uh, 20, uh, of the amount of money he needed. So he brought in two brothers. And I don't know if you've ever heard of these guys, uh, the Eckert brothers. Um, and the name, uh, my, my guess there, that was actually... Uh, 
a relative of theirs. And also uh, Aaron Wilhelm was involved in the Pennsylvania Bolt and Nut, uh, as well as the Lebanon Iron Company. Now their father actually, and their uncle had um, started the uh, Henry Clay Furnace in South Lebanon, not to be confused with the one down by Chickies, uh, you know, towards Columbia. And then that was uh, later renamed the Reading Iron Company. So these two brothers represented initially 75% ownership in the Pennsylvania Bolt and Nut, and Lord had 25% of ownership. In fact, all the way through up until the sale, the creation of American Iron and Steel, Lord managed to hold on to his 25% all the way through to you know uh, the creation of American Iron and Steel. Now, Wilhelm's involvement uh, is he bought out the, uh, the interest of the Eckert brothers and uh, he basically became president, owning the majority of the shares. But unfortunately, he died as, as, as 1889, and that actually opened the door for more familiar names, possibly, uh, Coleman and Brock. Now, uh, basically, when George Dawson Coleman died, he brought Horace Brock, who married uh, his daughter Debbie, into the business with the intention of basically uh, Horace was going to, you know, take over for uh, George Dawson Coleman. But then, unfortunately, George Dawson Coleman died uh in 1878 and horace then all of a sudden had a lot more responsibility than he was going to fortunately his brother married sarah coleman and uh he had a, a partner uh for and the two brock brothers um went into partnership with the uh the younger coleman boys uh, at one point they formed coleman and brock and so Col Coleman and Brock were actually involved in Pennsylvania Bolt and Nut, but then they did not, the Coleman and Brock was dissolved prior to American Steel. So you'll initially see just the Brock brothers involved in the early days of American Iron Steel. Later on, Bertrand Dawson Coleman and his brother Edward actually do come into the business, but not at its creation. Uh, you probably can't see this that well, I don't know, but, um, this just shows that uh, distant cousins married each other. So you have Robert Coleman, the original Robert Coleman, and uh, Robert's son, uh, James, has a son, George Dawson Coleman. Uh, he has uh, two daughters, Sarah, they, they had more kids, but they had two daughters, Sarah and Debbie, that married their distant cousins, Horace and Arthur Brock. And the, um, the uh, younger Brock married the older, uh, daughter and Arthur older than Horace married the uh, younger so uh, those it's, the, it's not the only time that a Coleman descendant married another Coleman descendant but it makes for interesting uh, thoughts this is just a little diagram showing the uh, the five companies when they were created and you know that they all merged into American Iron and Steel um, eventually, of course, um, they all merged into Bethan Steel. And we, I was talking with uh, Mike Emery a little bit before this talk started, and he asked, you know, where the, uh, where the, uh, the company buildings, where they were located. And uh, you might not necessarily recognize this building right off the top of your head, but that's the IU-13 building downtown Lebanon. Um, it was... You know, actually, if you look at the outside of the current building, it's, it's in really great shape and it still has the same character as the building. I like this little photo here. You can see the plant in the background, but you got a little car here and you got, you know, an old horse and buggy over here. So it's like indicative of the transition times that, that were going on around the turn of the century. Then they, uh, Central Works was what had been the Pennsylvania bolt and nut. Uh, plant and the East Works was what had been the uh, Lebanon Iron Company and the uh, West Works of Lebanon was the Lebanon East Iron Company. This is the uh, Sternberg um, plant in, uh, in Reading and uh, the reason why I didn't show the Wilhelm on here is because they sold it uh, pretty as I mentioned earlier. This you might not be able to see well enough. This is from a drawing that, that came from the Hagley uh, down in Wilmington, Delaware area. Great museum. Um, 
people who really, really are very, have great understanding of, of the industrial history of this country. But you can see how expansive and how large uh, this, the, the buildings and the operations were. It's just massive. It's hard to comprehend today when you look at those, the streets and the houses, and it's hard to imagine what it would have been like uh, over 100 years ago standing and looking at uh, this kind of massive industrial complex. Probably can't read this, but this is from the uh, first brochure, uh, sales brochure, if you will, that American Iron and Steel put together. And I, I, I show this for two reasons primarily, is you can see the kind of products that they had, uh, refined merchant bar, iron bolts, nuts, washers, boiler, tank, rivets, screws, uh, notice it says the Harvey patent grip, uh, grip thread. We'll see another slide with that in a minute. Cold press threads, railroad spikes, forgings. It's, it's really just a massive number of products. And the, and the thing about American Iron Steel was another evidence that big business had arrived uh, in, in Lebanon is that, you know, you, you think about the iron furnace and uh, uh, the Cornwall iron furnace when before the, the hot blast furnaces and, and how far their product, which was pretty much mostly pig iron or, or some cast products, they didn't travel that far. Maybe they made it to Philadelphia or maybe they made it to Baltimore. Um, and even when the blast, the hot blast furnaces started, you, they were still selling their pig iron to, um, you know, Pennsylvania steel, to Lackawanna, uh, other steel makers, uh, once in a while, they actually made a sale out in Pittsburgh uh, if the conditions were right. But it, it wasn't really, none of the iron, uh, iron uh, producing uh, companies in Lebanon really had a national and international uh, uh, scope. But here, the rise of, of big business, actually American Iron Steel had a national, international pre uh, presence. They, uh, Pennsylvania uh, bolt nut, as well as later American Iron Steel, won various awards and shows in Europe and in this country, and they uh, won a lot of first and second prizes for their products. And they give a little history right here of, uh, you know, basically saying the five companies had, had come together to form American Iron Steel. I want to point this out because you see here the Harvey grip and the ideal nut <laughs> so i mean we could we probably all know an ideal nut if we think hard enough but uh this was uh a, basically they shaved off from the it, they made a, the nut just a little differently than the normal hexagon and they had uh, some mechanism in the bolt and the nut so that it was fastened uh tighter and more reliably than any other bolt and nut that had been produced at that point. These are patents that Sternberg uh, had applied for. This became a, a important enough that basically you have a whole page in their sales brochure just on this. In, in the industry, this was, if you will, famous. Um, and I, I show these uh, slides again, if you can see the forgings, all the different kind of forgings they have, car forgings, uh, bolts, you know, stirrups, um, you know, just all kinds of electric railroads, um, tele telegraph poles, braces for the, the telegraph poles. And if you look at the index, you know, just the number of different types of bolts and screws and washers that, that they produce. That, this is not all their products. This is just a sampling. Just wanted to give you an idea of, of how, how massive this company really was in terms of what they offered. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Reading Works uh, closed shortly after they formed. Charles Wilhelm purchased that for A. Wilhelm Paints. And then um, an interesting thing that happened is in 1901, <laughs> this is like, you know, uh, fantastic because it came as a surprise of everybody. Can you imagine going to the, the board meeting? Everything's like kind of normal. <clears throat> and then Sternberg announces that he had purchased all of uh, Warren, uh, William Warren Gibbs is shared, 100,000. All of a sudden, Arthur Brock, who comes as the president uh, because of the, the way the shares were, he's now out of that job and Sternberg's taken over. It was just like kind of a, a, a really great little coup on Sternberg's part that took everybody surprise. So at this point now, and it's important that uh, Sternberg is president, 
Uh, James Lord is actually managing the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, Sternberg is, is very hands-on, but Lord is actually the, the manager of uh, the, the, the operations. Arthur and Horace were never really hands-on, but they were very, very bright uh, and skillful uh, financiers, if you will, and, and, and managers. <coughs> so, Sternberg's president and Lord is manager. And what happens in 1902? Well, you, you probably may have, may have known about the strike that was uh, in the anthracite coal region, but the, the whole capital versus labor kind of controversy, there's a whole history of that. But after the Civil War, you start to see the rise of big business. You start to see the, the rich, uh, you know, the Gilded Age, uh, a lot of money in the hands of capital, and there's arguments on either side as to who might have, you know, what rights the labor had, what right capital had. I'm not gonna get into that tonight. I just wanna point out that there had been strikes. And the, the, the more you get into the later 1800s and then the early 1900s, the more frequent the uh, strikes become. Some of these strikes involve uh, the National Guard being called in as in the Great Rail, uh, Southwest Railroad strike of, of 1886. The Homestead strike, the Pullman, uh, they all had National Guard uh, brought in. There were uh, some unfortunately deaths in all of these strikes. There were, were people killed on both sides of the capital and, and, and the labor. Uh, so it's the, the, the final one there is the, the Amphrocyte strike of 1902 was actually not too far away from us. Uh, it was just a little bit north in, in Scranton and in, in the Amphrocyte coal region. Uh, that's very famous because it's the first time that the federal government, uh, with Teddy Roosevelt's uh, you know, leadership, was, got involved, the federal government got involved to settle that strike. During that same year, when you already have the, the, the strike going on not too far away from you, you, you have a strike that starts in your neighborhood. Now, this little block right here, if you can see, that was the North Lebanon furnaces. That was what the... Uh, George Dawson Coleman had started. Uh, this is the area that would have been the Colebrook furnaces that Robert H. Coleman built. Now you might not be able to see it that well, but right here there's a red block area and there's a blue line right here. The blue line is the Quitapalea Creek. The red line is basically the area where the, uh, where the strike uh, was focused. This is where American and Steel had you know, their plants. You can still see some of the this is a modern you know, image uh, here, but you can still see some of the plants that, that are still standing, some of the old buildings that are, that are there. I wanna point this out because uh, during the strike, this area south of the, cre of the, of the creek is going to be uh, important. All right, so this gentleman right here is HMM Richard. Now that, that uh, is Henry Valcor, Muhlenberg Richards. And um, you might not recognize that name, but a lot of this history that we are going over tonight is actually because Richards was an author. And actually, if you go in on the internet and you type in HMM Richards, you'll see some of the things that he's written. He wrote for the, he wrote a pamphlet uh, on the history of American iron steel for the Lebanon County Historic Society that, um, has provided a lot of the information that I'm going over tonight. He's really kind of an extraordinary man. He also, you know, he, he, uh, he had artistic side to him, he had a business side to him, he uh, had a military background, um, and his pedigree is, is interesting to us because he has, uh, uh, is, uh, he has uh, uh, descent, uh, ancestors, uh, Conrad Weiser is, is his ancestor. Conrad Weiser's uh, youngest uh, daughter married Henry Muhlenberg, and then um, Henry Muhlenberg's daughter married a Richards. And so HHM Richards comes down through the Conrad Weiser and the Henry Muhlenberg, a uh, very famous, you know, one of the founders of the Lutheran Church in this country. Uh, so he's, he's got this very interesting pedigree. Uh, he's quite an incredible man. Um, and we'll have a little bit of his story as we go along here. 
So the strike is going on up in the coal region, but there's some tensions that are starting in Lebanon. So the puddlers and the finishing department were asking for a raise. They wanted a 50 cent uh, per ton raise from $4 to $4.50. And um, they, they, uh, they felt like this was reasonable. There was an article in the newspaper during this period where Sternberg and Lord both individually wrote in the in the paper their defense of why it was unreasonable for them to give the raise but they offered four dollars and 25 cents a ton so they met them halfway the workers uh said no that's not enough everybody else around us in lancaster in western pennsylvania everybody's making 450 a ton we want 450 a ton so they had an impasse both Sternberg and Lord went into the Lebanon paper and uh, made their defense. A couple of days later, an ex-employee of American Iron Steel uh, in, in the manufacturing area, he wrote his response and basically defended why the $4.50 was reasonable. But they were at an impasse. There no, neither side was willing to move. So the real, real tension started uh, on May 5th. The, uh, the company, brought in, um, they, they uh, well, no, uh, lost my train of thought. 800 workers went on strike. So that, that, that was, uh, that was the, the beginning of the strike, but they, they had thousands of employees. So it didn't re represent the entire workforce. It basically just represented the uh, puddlers and the finishers and, and people associated with, with that area. Uh, time went on a couple months and the they were having talks and, and talks did not go anywhere. So in August, the company brought in replacement, replacement workers. Now that what they did, they, they brought in uh, pretty much African-American workers that were from Birmingham, Alabama. And, and you may know that Birmingham, Alabama, Alabama was one of the biggest iron and steel making areas in the country. So they brought these workers up and they, they brought them into Reading and they brought them down on the train into Lebanon. Uh, the platform of the train station was not so far away from, uh, from the uh, company. And uh, they brought the, the, the workers in and, and as the uh, train stopped, the, uh, the strikers would basically, they, they, they tore open the doors to where the, the uh, replacement workers were and they started to throw stones at them and they were like calling them names and you can imagine and they were calling uh, they were saying ba ba black sheep that was one of the 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 uh phrases that is repeated throughout this entire strike and um even to uh workers that did go back to the job during the strike when they left the plant they would oftentimes uh be hit with stones and had things thrown at them and and be uh, and the uh, strikers would shout "ba ba black sheep" to them, and actually, uh, the the uh, strikers insult, uh, assaulted a couple of the employees that had gone back to work, and there was a court case that uh, was then um, that happened in Lebanon just about that particular incident. So there were there were tensions that were going on during this time period, and there were workers. People that had gone back to work were being followed, sometimes by a crowd. One, one time it was like a thousand people and um, a deputy uh, had to, you know, lift up his gun and, you know, threatened uh, to shoot. And it was a big incident and the mayor had to get involved and they had to make statements and put a curfew in place. So there was, a, you can imagine the tension that was going on in this community. The community is not the, it was a pretty good size. There were thousands of people in the community of Lebanon at that time. And, you know, you've got like 800 or more of that population that are on strike and their families that are affected. It, it, was, it was quite a, a group of people that were, you know, dissatisfied and anxious. And, and as time went on, tensions began to increase. So that takes us up to uh, September 22nd. And this is the first time that the strikers actually uh, had an attack on the plant. And um, unfortunately, 
there was a, a, a young man, he was still, still a teenager, William Hoffman. Uh, he was shot uh, just by, you know, it was a stray bullet that was fired. It wasn't fired at him, but unfortunately it hit him on the side of the head and he immediately went into a coma and he died. Um, and the thing is, he was actually a messenger for American Iron Steel and he had been done for the day, he'd finished his work, he went home, he had his dinner, and he and a buddy of his heard the commotion going on down the plant and said, hey, let's go down and let's see what's going on. So it's like, you know, let's just, they, they weren't part of the, the protests, they weren't part of the you know, agitators, but unfortunately this young man lost his life as uh, one of the few casualties uh, fatal casualties during this period. The next day, and that's why I'm, I want you to remember where I drew the blue line where the creek was, the, uh, they, they planned a, a, another attack on the plant. This time, they all lined up uh, uh, south of, of the creek, and the thing is, that you wouldn't know it, but back then it was a cornfield, and they had uh, numerous people with rifles and pistols and the thing is that they even had a couple small cannons <laughs> it's like firing at the plant and they basically you know laid siege to the plant and there uh they actually uh officers of the company as well as the replacement workers had to uh barricade themselves in the plant and their guns were fired inside h and this is what i meant about hm richards how incredible he was he was treasurer of American Iron Steel, and he was in the plant trying to defend the plant, and a bullet pierced him, and it hit his rib and bounced out of his body and did not stay in his body. He probably would have died. Just a weird fluke thing. It, 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 it hit his rib and bounced out, and, and he survived lived a, a very long time but i mean it was you know it was touch and go there fortunately on that day and so they'd already been called the pennsylvania 12th regiment came to town and that when the regiment came in uh they came by you know train and when they arrived they arrived that night everybody quieted down and calm came to the area so uh, the gentleman, uh, Colonel C.M. Clement, that's his picture down there below uh, Richards. See him in his uniform there. He was actually a businessman himself. He was involved in um, railroad business in uh, Pennsylvania, but he was also head of the 12th Regiment of uh, you know, National Reserve. Uh, when he was here, everything quieted down. He was entertained um, every night. Somebody had him over to their house and some of his immediate, um, you know, uh, officers. And one of the people that had him over for dinner one night was H.H. H. Light. And uh, there was a little blurb in the newspaper about, you know, he was entertained that night. So for Clement, he shows up, everybody quiet, quiets down, and he gets a few days of being entertained. And, and uh, so violence stopped. The replacements left on the 30th of uh, September. The regiment. Uh, and, and that was uh, pretty orderly. They, they basically snuck them out in the middle of the night. They didn't do it during the daytime. And uh, they uh, put, them on, put the replacement workers on a train that went to Pittsburgh. The uh, next, uh, on the 1st of October, the regiment went ahead and left. And uh, there were meetings going on during this period of time between the, uh, the company and the strikers. And um, some of the strikers had already started to go back to work. But um, when the replacement workers had showed up, the 800 workers were joined by almost everybody except for some of the blacksmiths and people like that. So almost the entire company had gone out on strike when the replacement workers came. And uh, the company agreed to the 450. I mean, this has now been like six months or so. Uh, everybody was suffering. The company was suffering. Um, you know, they had all the, you know, they weren't making any money. They, they weren't meeting the projections. And uh, the workers were suffering. They were having a hard time getting by, feeding their families. It was just very fortunate for the community that this did get settled. The company agreed to 450. Because the workers still during the negotiations at this time were not willing to take less than 450. And then on the 20th of October, it was in the paper, 
all the workers returned and the company promised and pretty much held up their part of the bargain that nobody would be punished. There uh, was actually only one arrest uh, during uh, this entire strike with a conviction, and that was, uh, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name, but he was from Avon, which is, you know, where the Walmart is, that area. And though, so it was ended. I don't know if you realize that we had this kind of a strike in Lebanon, but I found it very fascinating when I was going through this uh, and going through the various newspaper articles and reading, you know, day after day. And I mean, I'm probably not doing a good job of conveying the uh, fears and the tension that existed in the community, but um, it was uh, frightening for a lot of people. The uh, company, do you think that when they agreed to the 450 that they all of a sudden became an enlightened capitalist? Well, I'm not so sure. This is the final word offered in their, uh, when they, uh, uh, you know, fit their annual report. Notwithstanding the interruption to our work in the rolling mill departments for nearly six months, ending October 20th last, by an unreasoning strike of workmen. So I don't think that they became enlightened capitalists, but they did pay good wages and, and they did so for years and they ran a good business, but the uh, strike did not change their opinion about the, uh, the relationship between uh, you know, the workers' demands and you know what they needed to do to keep things running. I don't want to moralize or anything right there, but I do want to point out that uh, in top of the the strike that went on later in 1902, there was a very 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 bad accident, and 13 men died while working uh, with an explosion from one of the furnaces. So that just I mean that's not mentioned here, but that is uh, 1902 will just go down in history for Lebanon County as probably just a horrific, terrible year. And I don't know what you would have to find to match how bad that year was, but all's well that ends well. Uh, when um, Bethlehem Steel purchased uh, American Iron Steel in uh, 1917, uh, James Lord was still at the helm, and he was given a, uh, a victory celebration or acknowledging all his hard years of, of dedication and work <clears throat> to like 80 prominent, you know, executives. There was just a slew of who's who in Lebanon at that time. Uh, William Freeman Jr. gave uh, the toast, and Bertram Dawson Coleman um, gave a talk just all celebrating the dedication that James Lord did. It was the day, the night before the final sale to Bethlehem Steel. And many of you or some of you may have had people you knew or maybe yourself uh, actually worked uh, at, the, uh, at the plant when it was owned by Bethlehem Steel. It's just a little slice of history, how it got formed and a little drama on the strike. Uh, thank you very much for attending tonight. I appreciate your uh, support and commitment, and especially, you know, on behalf of the furnace, we could never do the things we do without your uh, support and help. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jim. That was a really great talk. We do have a few questions, uh, if you'd like to, uh, to entertain them. Sure, and, I love questions. All right, so Judith asked, using current street names, where was American Iron and Steel located? Okay, uh, so you know where Lehman Street is, right? I'm not gonna be able to blow this up that well, probably. Um, you see here, uh, this is 422 right here, right? I think I got that right. Okay. Yeah, Weidman Street, I see Weidman right here. Down in this area uh, is Weidman, uh, Lincoln Avenue, which I think is actually 16th, isn't it? Uh, from Lincoln Avenue, this line right here, uh, all the way down to where Walmart is. So if you kind of follow Lehman Weidman Street and use uh, uh, Cumberland, that's the, the block where the, the, the uh, plant existed. All right. And uh, part two to her question was, 
Who was coal oil light? Was that HH light? Coal oil? Yes, coal oil light. I guess that was a nickname. Uh, oh. I'm asking if that was HH light. That's a, I have no idea. I will now obviously have to look that up. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I, I will tell you that HH Light uh, had an influence on the Circle L. Um, they were young men at that time. Uh, Warlow and, uh, and um, oh, it just escapes me. Anyhow, uh, he uh, kind of mentored them in a way. Okay. Uh, we have another question that says, were the American Iron and Steel Workers unionized? And if not, did a union get involved in this strike? No, actually, that, I'm glad you brought that up because the owners, uh, Sternberg and Lord, especially in the paper, accused the strike as being related to the other strikes that were going on. And um, the, uh, the strikers assured them that there were no relationship uh, to any of the other strikes. They weren't organized from the outside. It was all an internally motivated strike. It, it was not influenced by any labor organizations on the outside. Now, um, American Iron Steel did have to, uh, uh, I guess, deal with unions, but it, it really was a moot point by the time uh, Bethlehem Steel uh, took over because Bethlehem had already had, when Bethlehem became the owner, it, they already had uh, relationships with unions. But American Iron Steel never really, I would say, embraced labor unions uh, per se. Okay. Uh, Mike Weber asked the question, it says that workers were seeking a 50 cent raise per ton of iron. How did that translate to an increase of wages? So I guess, did it ever mention like how many tons of iron people were doing a day? So what would that 50 cents mean to them? I've never done that math, um, but there are records uh, of the production in, in the company. Uh, it it, it would have... Um, I mean, figure 50 cents a, a ton and you're producing, you know, maybe uh, 20,000 tons, at, at least in a week time, in a week's time, uh, you know, you can translate that to it probably worked out in their daily wage, maybe another four, four to five dollars. Okay. But I, I don't, I have never actually done the math on it. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, but it gives an idea that it was going to be, you know, at least, you know, a fair amount. It was going to be significant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, another question we have, what is a puddler? Oh, okay. So uh, uh, puddling is, you know, a type of, a type of furnace where you take the heat source. So if, if you've ever taken a tour at the iron furnace, you know that you, you stack in levels of uh, what would have been for the, the, uh, the old furnace, the charcoal and, and the ore and the limestone, and it melts down and, and, and stuff. Well, with puddling, you separate out. There's usually a, a, a it's, it's like kind of a, a globular type of shape. You separate out the heat source, which would have been the, the coal, and um, from the actual iron. And the iron is heated in a more controlled fashion from the, the outside, but you never get the impurities of the heat source introduced into the uh, iron. And, um, but you do have to stir the, uh, and this is where the puddling name comes, you actually have to kind of stir. If you have ever, uh, you know, if you've made, um, you know, a cake batter or something like that, you have to, to stir it. Well, essentially, that's what they're doing with this molten iron is they have to constantly stir it. So you had to be very strong be able to keep it otherwise you didn't want it to harden at all uh you had to keep it in, in its kind of molten fluid aspect so it's basically the puddling part and there's different shapes that can be that could have been used but it's the the, the concept is both is really the separation of the heat source from the iron okay thank you jim uh carrie moan asked the railroad strike of 187, 1877 was widespread but it did not make the list did the numbers of strikers determine your, uh, the size? Uh, and, and Carrie's another Reading person, and I looked at that and thought, hey, what about that 1877 strike when the Lebanon uh, Railroad Bridge was burned? So 
Uh, you know what? Um, that put that should have been on the list. Uh, I, 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 there were at least 20 to 30 that were candidates for the list. And um, that's one that I probably should have included because it's like, you know, our neighborhood, if you will. Right. Uh, and, um, and there yeah, were a fair number of fatalities and also the National Guard was called out for that one. Yeah, wow. yeah they, it would have fit. And so if I ever give this presentation again, it will be in there. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're representing our, our Reading roots here. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, another question, uh, do you have an idea of how many of the uh, American Iron and Steel buildings still exist today? Okay, so you know that, um, if you go look at the giant, there's a couple of them in that area, right? Um, you know, across the street from the uh, the giant, I think um, uh, Frank Dixon used to have a recycling facility in there. Uh, and there's some buildings that are left there. Then you go down towards um, the, uh, oh, uh, I don't know, it's uh, the, the, where the railroad tracks are on Lincoln Avenue. I mean, actually, some of those buildings have been reclaimed and there's small businesses in them. But a lot of them have been torn down. Um, so I probably would think, and I've never actually walked it, but I would bet you probably only a quarter of the original buildings still exist in some fashion. But that could be still be dozens, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, there were, I mean, product moved around and they did so many different kinds of product. You had different types of machinery to produce different um, parts. So there were probably... I don't know, at least 50 or more buildings that were all in that area, separate individual buildings. Another question was HH, I believe this is Light, uh, the father-in-law of uh, Warlow. <clears throat> okay, so I'm trying to remember now. Um, Warlow's, I don't think Warlow married a Light, did he? Um, Oh, I, 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 I'd have to look that up. Did Warlow marry a light? I know that he, he uh, courted one of Light's daughters. Light had, I think, three daughters, and they were like, I guess, the catch of the town or something like that. Uh, if, light, if, if Warlow married a light, then it's definitely H.H. H. Light's daughter because Warlow looked to, used, used to look to Light for advice when he was starting out. Oh, I, I think she just answered. Uh, he said he married Pauline Light. Then that 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 that's that's H. H. Light's daughter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, and then I really just it looks like I have one final question. This is from uh, Brenda Regal. It said, "How many replacement workers were brought in from the South?" And second part, considering the tension toward them, did they stay in Lebanon during their time at the plant? Oh. Great question. So um, the, the number was, uh, no one has an exact number, but it was over 100. Somewhere around 140 or so workers, and they did not stay at anywhere. The company made them beds, and once they entered in to the, uh, into the area of, of the company, they never left. They, had, they ate their meals at the company, they, they, uh, uh, they slept there, they bathed there, they did not leave the plant once they arrived. Okay. Uh, and, and Mike Trump also wrote in for us, he said, Warlow and Quinn were married to Light Sisters. Quinn, that's right, yeah. Okay. Yep. So, okay. Uh, Carrie Moon wrote, wrote uh, in to us, he said that he'd recognize H.M.M. Richards, who was also very active in the Pennsylvania German Society. Uh, but he didn't know what he did for a living. And it's oh. funny because I also knew him from that and also from my time at Conrad Weiser. Uh, he also did some writing on French and Indian war sites, and he did several of the fort sites in and around Lebanon. So it was interesting because I didn't know this part of his story either. So it, it was really nice to see a little bit more for full circle what his uh, family connections were here in Lebanon. Yeah, it, it, he actually would be a good topic for a, a book. Absolutely. Right? He's a, it, he, I, I didn't know how much he did outside of, of this. It was, it, it's amazing. So, okay, I think that is the end of our questions. So, uh, 
So thank you very much for joining us uh, for this lecture. I especially would like to thank Jim Polzinski for his presentation and for Kathy Donaldson for helping to organize our virtual talk. I also want to thank the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace who sponsored this program. If you or your business would like to sponsor a future lecture, please contact the site for further information. And of course, donations are gladly accepted. I'd also hope that you can join us next month for our December 8th lecture, Cornwall Oral History Project, 1980 to 1982, a, a review of recently transcribed interviews in the collections of the Pennsylvania State Archives. And that'll be done uh, by Brett Ray, uh, who's here from Lebanon, uh, but works in uh, the Pennsylvania State Archives. So we look forward to the day when you can visit us at the museum again. Uh, and in the meantime, please stay safe and good night.